Julian Assange's life is in danger. His revelations through his amazing computer skills led to the U.S. Vice President calling him a high-tech terrorist, and other prominent Americans called for his assassination. Some Americans still have a lynching mentality, as he hasn't been charged with anything. Our Prime Minister called him reckless and irresponsible, but our federal police found that he didn't break any law. This is a David and Goliath battle of biblical proportions. How can we save him from the U.S.? Christine Assange, really, really happy to hear your voice again. How's it going? Good evening, Kathy. Good evening, Stuart, Susie, and audience. It's been a long time since you and I called up, Kathy. Remember, we met on a bus going to Parliament House. Uh, yep, to stand outside the front and protest what Obama was doing to my son. That's right, Canberra. Yes. And we're still fighting. So I don't know if you're a little bit tired. I'm a little bit tired, but I'm still fighting. Well, I understand because there was a bit of a lull when things seemed to stabilise a bit and Julian was fully functional, but it's a cliffhanger again, isn't it? We're right back to where we were in October 2011 where we didn't know what was going to happen next. Well, when he was in the embassy with President Rafael Correa from Ecuador leading a country, we felt it wasn't good for him to be besieged, arbitrarily detained by the UK in there, but at least he was safe and he was being looked after. Since the change of government and the pressure from the US on the current president, President Moreno, things have all gone back to being very, very worried for him again. Yes, I heard that the embassy staff had changed as well and, and it wasn't the same friendly people as before. So he really is very close to solitary confinement, isn't he? Yes, it's been four months now and he's been suffering from ill health as a result of the British government refusing to respond to his request positively for the normal minimum hour afforded prisoners of one hour of fresh air, exercise, sunshine, so they can get their vitamin D. And they've also refused him access to proper medical care or dental care, so he's had six years of that. And now there's solitary confinement on top of that and his examining doctors are very worried and are calling for him to be returned home for treatment. Yes, John Pilger said, and he's not the only one, Ross Cameron as well said that it wouldn't be so hard for Malcolm Turnbull to arrange that. Well, it wouldn't be hard for anybody actually and in a way it's in everybody's interest. The UK government is detaining him arbitrarily, and that was a UN decision after a 16-month investigation, they can stop this any time they like. Julian's not charged with any crime, and not even the bail. That's just a warrant, and it shouldn't have been issued, and it should have been rescinded, because it's attached to an old Interpol arrest warrant, which has now been dropped because there's no evidence. So there's an old warrant sitting there being used, and the UK government is more than capable of stopping its extradition at any time. They did so with Augusto Pinochet, who was the US-installed dictator in Chile. There was a Spanish extradition warrant out for him and when he was living in the UK. And because he was a US-installed dictator, despite the fact that he was wanted on multiple charges of mass rape, murder and torture, the UK government paid his defence. And then, <laughs> that's bad enough, but the top extradition lawyer, in fact, it was the same extradition lawyer that the UK government paid to prosecute Julian. Claire Montgomery. Uh, yes, Claire Montgomery. Yes. And the Spanish judge who's defending Julian was the same judge who was prosecuting Pinochet. Now, when it got as far as the High Court, and the High Court ruled that Pinochet should be extradited to Spain to face these charges, the UK government just overruled their own court and protected him. So when the UK government carries on about, oh, we must clear this through, it's absolute rubbish. They're doing so at the behest of the US, who wants Julian silence for exposing corruption. And let's face it, the Ecuadorian president has made it very clear he doesn't want Julian there. Donald Trump, I'm sure, doesn't want Julian in the US because he's got so much support over there and no one wants to test the First Amendment. 
UK doesn't want him there. They're spending millions of dollars withholding him without charge, and that's causing them a problem. Better off if everybody just agrees that he comes home and gets his medical treatment. If they want to make a fuss about anything, they can do it from America to Australia. That's right. And the Inter-American Court gave the advice that every country involved should work together exactly. to preserve exactly. the sanctity of it, international sanctity of asylum. Well, I think that particularly the Inter-American Court ruling was about non-refoulement, which means that you cannot send a person who has sought asylum back to a country or to a country from which they were seeking asylum. And this would be what would be happening if they evicted Julian from the embassy, put him into UK hands, and he ended up in the US. Well, that's presupposing that they can't find that loophole where the British prison is the in-between. I mean, they obviously won't release the indictment until he's in custody. Wasn't that the whole point of putting him in custody in Sweden to create... Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right, Cathy. A US grand jury indictment cannot be served until the suspect is first in custody, and that's why the well, Snowden document, which came out later showed that the US in August 2010 had asked their war allies, which included Sweden and the UK, secretly to charge Julian with something after the, his war documents were published with WikiLeaks. And within, uh, I think it was 10 days to a week, Sweden had launched this allegation of sexual abuse. And to cut a long story short, because it happened twice, what they wanted to do was get him into custody because then they could serve the grand jury subpoena mm. and via a back door in the US-U-Swedish uh, extradition treaty, which is called temporary surrender, they could quickly render him yeah. to the US. Yeah. Now, in the UK, it's just as bad mm. because the UK-US extradition treaty you do not have to have a prima facie case. So if you're looking at the, the there's no, there's absolutely no pop up process, legal process for my son. The US grand jury is in secret. It has four prosecutors. It has no defence material allowed, and it has no judge. Then that comes into the UK, hmm. and if the Ecuadorian embassy evicts Julian, and the UK grab him on that now defunct warrant which should be defunct, it's not a charge. They can then drop that once they've got him in there because they know they won't get it through court. Yes. And then, <laughs> then they'll serve the grand jury indictment for which there's been no proper legal process. Mm. Then they can extradite Julian to the US, again without legal process because you don't have to present a prima facie case. All right? Yes. Um, and then when he gets over there under the National Defence Authorisation Act, mm. he can be detained indefinitely without trial. Well, yeah, that could be him for the rest of his life, actually. Uh, it's indefinite. Yeah. And, and face the death penalty or 45 years in jail if we see him at all for trial. <sighs> oh, that's so terrible. It's like a vice. It's horrific. It, it's horrific. It's a vice. I mean, it's very hard to find the move that is going to be successful. I do recall John Pilter saying that he needed an X-ray. How bad does it have to get? In terms of well, it's basically um, the UN expert panels on arbitrary detention did a 16-month investigation to which Julian's lawyers, the Sweden and the UK put in written submissions. After looking at all the information and taking uh, witness statements, they determined that Julian had been arbitrarily detained since 2010. That is, illegally detained. He had yeah. not been charged. He had not undergone proper process for the entire time and multiple violations of his human rights. God, how they hate the truth. What we're looking at now is a multi-award winning journalist, editor, author, TV presenter and film producer, because Julian is all of those, who has been given Australia's highest journalism award, the Walkley Award, yeah. who has been detained without charge for nearly eight years and tortured for six of them. And the Australian government has done nothing. Now, yeah. Is there any chance of him getting his passport renewed? Uh, Julian has tried to renew his passport and the um, computer won't allow him to do that. The computer says oh, no. Which means that the government is not allowing him to do it. No. Mm. Well, um, Britain do have to decide on this and they did decide not to extradite Gary McKinnon 
and the situation wasn't that uh, dissimilar. Um, well, it was, but yeah. <laughs> that was a hacking charge, not a publishing charge. But do you think there's a chance that it could be voted down by the British Parliament? What, the Julian's extradition could yeah. be voted down? Not a chance. No. Not a chance. In fact, I would go as far as to say the planning and dirty politics behind the political persecution of my son has reached the point where to assuage the British public, they have withheld extradition of British citizens because Julian is not a British citizen and there was a lot of uproar about these extraditions to the US because, you know, obviously any any British citizen can be extradited in that way, not just some, someone who's there like Julian. Mm. And to take the heat off it all and to prevent people fighting for Gary McKinnon or Laurie Love, who later followed him, yeah. there was a ground swell of support for both of those British citizens and activism on the ground for it. Now, if they had extradited them, the group of people that had been amassed to support both those British men would have flowed over to support Julian. Yeah. So by not extraditing them, and in fact, cynically running Laurie Love's case the day before Julian was contesting that warrant meant that it didn't even hit the media cycle properly. Right. Because everyone was so overjoyed about that. My heart sank. The moment that I saw that Laurie Love case was listed the day before Julian's my heart sank on you the fix was in um, I'm glad for Laurie yeah. um, but I knew that the next day it was going to be fixed and the judge that was put on that case when Julian was contesting the warrant yes. was Lady Arbuthnot yes. who is the wife of a defence minister Lord Arbuthnot, who was a previous defence minister on lots of defence procurement committees, but not only that, had since had left Parliament, was high up in two defence contractor companies, and on one of them was sitting with the head of MI6. Oh, shit. That's great. Well, um, I was listening to Greg Barnes today, and he said while the Americans and Jeremy Hunt and even Moreno saying, I don't agree with Mr. Assange's activities, yeah. breaking into people's private email. I mean, making out that he was a whistleblower, you know. Um, but Greg said today that our foreign minister and prime minister were not condemning Julian, not like Julia Gillard had, not making up things. They were very circumspect. So he saw that as... Oh, they're being silent. Yeah, that's right. They're being complicit. Yeah, like a client state. I mean, there's the old saying, evil flourishes when good men do nothing. And that's exactly what's happened. Yeah. So do you think they're just going to all deliver? I mean, Livy goes to Texas and we are looking at the death penalty, perhaps. Well, these are the facts. In 2010, Donald Trump publicly stated that he thought that WikiLeaks journalists should get the death penalty. Yeah. During the elections, when WikiLeaks was releasing documents which showed that both Hillary Clinton and the DNC, the Democratic National Convention and the entourage <clears throat> were corrupt, they have been rigging the primaries for Democrats for Hillary and against Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Showed a lot of corruption came out of those documents. Mm. Then Trump says, I love WikiLeaks, mm. right? Mm. Within weeks of being sworn in as president, his attorney general, Jeff Sessions was saying that charging Julian was a priority. His CIA director, Mike Pompeo, was calling him a non-state intelligence agency that was hostile. Yes. Trump then promoted Gina Haspel, uh, Gina. who was... Yeah, bloody Gina, uh, as her colleagues call her, uh, or Gina the torturer, against the advice of 100 former US ambassadors who said the woman was a nightmare and enjoyed torture. He promoted her anyway. He then promoted Pompeo from CIA director to US Secretary of State. Yeah. So it's not looking good. And yet... With all this Russiagate propaganda, Trump really should be, and there is a lot of bad media in the US, a lot of propaganda going out of the media, because under the National Defense Authorization Act, there is another clause, and that is that the US government can now legally propagandize their public, and that took an act. Wow. So now they're using all this propaganda, Russia and Julian's associated with Russia and all this stuff, 
probably to get around the First Amendment so they can use espionage to get him instead. Well, I mean, they've got one big problem, that there is no evidence whatsoever that WikiLeaks were involved with Russia. There seems to be quite a lot of links between the Trump campaign and Russia, but they've all gone a bit silent on finding evidence of any connection between WikiLeaks and Russia. So, Well, there is none. And in fact, Julian is supported staunchly by a group of former CIA, FBI and NSA senior ranking officers who have created a group called Veteran Intelligence Professional Society. They actually advised Bush that there were no weapons of mass destruction and were ignored. They have supported Julian and, in fact, honoured him with the Sam Adams Award for Integrity and Intelligence, the global annual US award by US intelligence office for the pristine reporting of the war and the war crimes. Mm -hmm. They have advised President Trump that they have gone through as technical advisors And Bill Binney, who was the architect of the NSA, has done the same. And they have concluded and sent a memorandum to the president that based on their research and their knowledge, the DNC servers or Democratic National Party servers from which the emails were taken could not have been accessed from the outside. The download speeds were too fast. That's right. They were consistent with a copy to a USB stick. Exactly. Yeah? So, But that seems to have been ignored. That came out about 10 months ago. And why do we have the press over here parroting the Russiagate scenario of the hacking, the Russian hacking? Well, the ABC are the worst. The ABC, the state broadcaster, is the worst. And I've come across a very interesting article some time ago and reread it again this week, Cathy. An article written by a former CIA officer called Philip McGee. And he wrote that the CIA, during his time with the CIA, which was many years, had infiltrated around the world what he called civil society groups who were capable of changing public opinion and holding governments to account. And he said they had infiltrated at regional, local and international levels student groups, unions, political parties, women's groups and state media. Mm. All right. Now, I don't know whether ABC has been infiltrated, but this is what he's saying. And right. one would look at the state media at the moment and you have got to wonder because I have had to pull them up on calling Julian a hacker constantly. They will not refer to him as a journalist. The interview between Sarah Ferguson and Hillary Clinton, I mean, she didn't pull Clinton up on anything no. <laughs> I mean, there exactly. Were, there were things that were absolutely untrue, and how could she not mention the Podesta emails, the contents of the emails? I mean, it's always just strictly stick to the script of kill the messenger, isn't it? Well, that's exactly right, Cathy. And in fact, even the CIA or the DNC has never, ever said that any of those emails weren't authentic. Yeah, that's right. I know. Well, look, Christine, I have heard one scenario that Trump might want Julian to go through trial so that it will prove that he had nothing to do with the so-called Russian hacking. What do you think of that story? Well, um, who knows? President Trump can change his mind within 24 hours. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So let's hope if that's the case that it's on a good day. But certainly we at Unity for Jay, that's this group that Susie and Elizabeth and Cassandra have got together. I've joined it. But there's 2,700 people nearly who are people just like us who are doing their very best to stop it from getting there. Yes, that's the important thing. It's all very well to say, well, just send you when we get over there. But that's too late. We've got to stop it happening because, as I said before, under the NDAA, he can just disappear without a trial. And they may not want to bring this to trial over there because you've got the First Amendment, all right? They're not going to want to test that. So the thing is to prevent him getting there um, and what people can do if, if they want to help Julian is to contact your local politician, the one that you would normally vote for and senator, and your unions and your journalist unions, and we need bodies on the street in front of Parliament. We need people writing letters. You know, you can contact, obviously, whatever your political parties are. We need medical associations involved. So if there's anybody that you think might have influence on the government, contact them. And, of course, directly the Prime Minister 
as an opposition leader and the foreign minister. Yeah, I think in Australia, support is paramount and also outside the embassy. Australia needs to stand up. I mean, we have to decide. It's all very well talking about, oh, we want to be a republic. Well, why do we want to be a republic? Because we want to be a sovereign nation. We want to break away from the British rule, okay? But if you're not going to stand up for your citizens when a great big bully superpower is uh, threatening them, detaining without charge and torturing them, then you're not a sovereign nation. So we're either a sovereign nation or we're not. And a lot of people came to this country, actually, because they wanted to live in a sovereign nation. They don't want to live in a US state, right? Um, We want to be our own country, our own people. And this is a very good case to get behind because Julian is dying. He's being slowly murdered. (sighs) He's being slowly murdered. And this is a really disgusting thing, Cathy, is they've got nothing to charge him with. So because he's done nothing wrong. So instead of doing the right thing, go, okay, well, we're going to charge you, we're going to go to court, and we're going to have it out, right? They have chosen deliberately not to go to court and to keep him detained in there and to refuse him the normal requirements of life, fresh air, exercise, sunshine, medical care, so that he will gradually die. Oh. And his doctors are now saying if he's not gotten out of there, that's exactly what will happen. He will die. His doctors are already saying he has irreversible damage to his mind and body now. He's in pain. He has been in chronic pain now for two years. Oh. And they refused safe passage to go to a hospital. They will arrest him straight away and put him in jail where that US subpoena will be served. If we do this to Julian, I mean, we're going to look back in years and go, why the hell did that happen? Felicity Ruby wrote a wonderful list of WikiLeaks releases that had helped people all around the world. Julian's a good guy that that doesn't think of himself, is willing to take sacrifices, but he has done good for humanity. And I think Australians at least need to stand up for him. He's always been a good guy. But a lot of people don't know about Julian's background. At about 19 or 20, he became a single dad and had had full custody of his son when mum was having a few problems um, coping. And he maintained that for years and he put his university degree on hold so he could be a hands-on father to his little toddler son. He started one of the first internet providers in Australia. I think it was called Suburbia. And he made that free to all community groups. And he helped them set up their own stuff. Then later on, he was approached by the police because he... And went, well, he did a little bit of hacking when he was a kid, but he never did any damage. It was a look, what they called a look-see hacker, and a lot of kids were doing it. Yeah. It was their version of Mount Everest in the digital age. Can we get into this and have a look? And what they would do is if they did get in, they wouldn't do any damage, the good ones, the bright young kids, and they'd have a look, and they'd just leave a message, your site, you know, this is actually insecure. So they're actually, in, in a way, warning people, look, people can get into this. And that's all they did. Once the police found out about this, they then approached Julian, and they asked him if he would help bust a pedophile ring. He did it free of charge online. He also helped take off the net, again for the police, a terrorist handbook about making bombs. Oh. So it's not as all of a sudden, you know, Julian's become this great guy. He's always been a good guy. Yeah, and he's always done it for free, hasn't he? WikiLeaks has always, he's always done it for free. free. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And it cost, and, and cost him his freedom. And it shouldn't. And look, I could never be as brave as Julian, and most of us couldn't. But what we can do when we have people who are as brave as this to get thrown up through our history is stand up for them. Yeah. We can't do what they do. Few people would do it, what he did. But we can stand up and protect them and we can stand up to our governments and say, no, evil is not going to flourish because good men are going to do something and you are not going to take this man and detain him eight years without charge just because he exposed corruption. And you're not going to torture him and you're not going to extradite him and then throw him in jail where he'll never be seen again because we're good people and we're going to stand up. And throughout history, we're only at this point in time now because our ancestors stood up against evil. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I was just going to ask you, I know that his legal team can get in to see him and one of those is obviously Jennifer Robinson. Yes. Have you heard from Jen um, how his morale is at the moment? 
Well, um, Julian's very resilient, okay, even though his body is really suffering and yeah. he's in pain. Yeah. He, he has the resilience that comes from knowing that you're standing on solid ground in morally good dirt. Okay, so he knows that he's done nothing wrong. He's only brought the truth to the people and held their governments accountable. So there's a strength that comes from that. I and he's resilient in that sense. However, he is also a human being and he has a body that needs nourishment and attention. And while his spirit is willing, his body is like all of our bodies. It needs to be nourished and it's not happening and he's not getting medical care and he's being bullied. We see our governments, we say, oh, isn't bullying terrible? You know, we've all got to stand up against bullying and it goes on and on and on. And what have we got? We've got probably the most extreme example of bullying on the entire planet sitting up there in the Ecuadorian embassy. A single man being bullied by two governments and the incomplete resources of two governments. Yeah. And one of those governments bullying another government, that's Ecuador, and our government, his country, his prime minister, standing by and watching him being bullied. Yeah. Now, don't we tell our children in our playground, if you see someone being bullied, don't let that happen, stand up and say something? Yeah. yeah that's well, I'm asking the Australian people to stand up and say something and say, no, we're better than this, we're not going to let this happen. And if you don't have guts, Mr Turnbull, to do it, we're going to make you do it because the will of the people is going to be so strong, you will have no choice. Yeah. Yeah, we'll do that for you, Christine. We will. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. I want to say thank you to everybody that's stood up and is standing up because it does make a difference. It holds off the worst excesses at the moment. He hasn't been evicted, and that I am sure has to a large degree got to do with the groundswell support that's suddenly come on yes. in, in the last... Yep. Um, so you mightn't think anything's being stopped, but I think it is. I uh, think so more, too. Yeah. You know, people don't have to do this. They're doing this because they want to. Mm. They're taking out time and they're taking out money, donating to his legal defence fund. I really appreciate it. It's not only is it helping save his life... But it's really helping boost his morale and his family's morale for us to keep going. Really thank you from the bottom of my heart. We thank you too for speaking to us tonight, Christine. Courage to you as well as a mother. It, you must have such mixed feelings, the most incredible pride in your son and at the same time this terrible fear that's just gone on and on and on for seven years now. Eight years, in fact, so when will it end? We, we want it to end well. We want Julian's human rights to be respected, his asylum to be respected, and for him to be brought back home to Australia and live a normal life again. Exactly. He has the same needs as other people. My son hasn't felt the grass on his feet for six years. He hasn't seen the sky except for a couple of times on the balcony and got to be really careful because he's worried about assassination. He hasn't held his children. He hasn't seen a bird. He hasn't heard a bird sing. He hasn't smelled fresh air. The sensory deprivation is shocking, really, really shocking. His eyesight is failing because he can't look into the distance. If this was going on in a third world country or Russia, there's human rights abuse at the level of a war crime. Yeah. If this was going on anywhere in a non-Western country, they would be all screaming at the top of their lungs. Yeah. They did more for a pedophile, one of the worst pedophiles the world has ever seen, as an Australian citizen, Peter Scully. Yeah. This pedophile was raping and killing babies, and the Australian government was over there with consular support. They gave him, what they were going to give him, $500,000 until there was a terrible outcry about it. I don't know how much of the money he actually received. They go and bail out people who have been charged with smuggling drugs. Yeah. My son's not been charged with anything, nothing. Yeah, yeah I know. I know. There's journalism. Journalism and doing it much better. More scoops and all of the MSN combined <laughs> in the last 30 years. It's too much too soon, perhaps. One of the things that really struck me about the emails that came out of the DNC and Hillary 
was the revelation that Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State under Obama, had decided that she was going to invade Libya because she wanted a feather in her cap for her run for the president. Yeah, presidency. That's, that's, okay. that's in the Podesta emails. Yeah, I, I read that yeah. one. Yes. Yeah. And what had effectively happened is that Libya was the cork on Europe. And there was a brilliant interview between uh, John Pilger, another wonderful Australian journalist, yeah. and my son, where they were all, Julian revealed all this, and John and Julian talked about it. And John's an incredible defender. And what effectively has happened is that once Libya was invaded and decimated, it fueled IS and uncorked Africa, Africa, and coming through, coming through the Middle East. And that's what caused the millions of refugees to flow into Europe. Well, and pretty much the slave trade as well that's going on. Today. And the and the slave trade. So this is the sort of information that he's revealing. And look what has happened as a result of that to all of Europe. And I would like to see Australian people, see a lot of people down there, uh, at the, you know, protesting the rights of refugees. Where are they on my son? My son's an Australian political refugee. He has not only is being tortured and detained without any kind of charge or trial, but he's the one who's blown the whistle on why all the other refugees are in the trouble that they're in. Well, what kind of a world is it where you have to destroy a state, a leader, and what about 40,000 people are killed in order to get a feather in your cap? But if you are anti-war and you're denouncing war crimes, then you get tortured. What kind of world is it today, Christine? Well, it's one we have to fight against, isn't it? Liberty isn't something that we attain and then go, oh, isn't that great, we've now got liberty, and then go back and just enjoy our lives. We've got to continually fight for it because there are always people trying to take it away. People in large corporations, they don't want the people to have liberty. They want the corporations to have as much control as possible. And with the internet and the surveillance it's been going around the globe, now something that Julian... Uh, and WikiLeaks exposed in their Vault 7 exposés on the CIA, that never has liberty been more under threat than right now because of the technology. So we've got this intersection in history of the rise of technology and the rise of totalitarianism, whether it's under left or right, because both sides are capable of abusing power, and that's a really important thing for people to become aware of, yeah. that both left and right can abuse power and there are various different types of left and there's various different types of right. The traditional left is still very much supporting Julian. Mm. The liberal left, which has allied themselves with the more wealthy classes, are not so much, definitely. But the Unity for J movement to support Julian, I'm working with all sorts of people. I'm working from people who are Trump supporters, the socialists and everything in between. What all of Julian supporters have in common, regardless of their political ideologies or backgrounds, is the desire to maintain democracy and freedom and free speech, free press, uh, fair legal process and human rights are part of that. And we can all come together on that. Even if we want to argue till the cows come home about every other brand of thing that we uh, stand up for, those four things are what ensure liberty. That's true. That's true. Well, I think we've um, kind of run out of time, Christine. Um, okay, Cathy. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Bye, Christine. Bye.